Welcome to the Cabinet Secretary Lecture at the Blavatnik School of Government. Please welcome to the stage, Nairi Woods, Dean of the Blavatnik School of Government. Well, good afternoon and a very warm welcome to all of you uh, to the Blavatnik School of Government and to the Cabinet Secretary Lecture. And a very special welcome to Sir Mark Sedwell, about whom I'll say a little more in a moment. One of Britain's great strengths as a nation, as a country, as a society, lies in its public service, in the brilliant and talented people across this country who are drawn to serve, to serve as civil servants, police officers, care workers, NHS staff, in the armed services, as teachers and as researchers. Here in Oxford, as the Cabinet Secretary has been hearing about today, we can see what a great research university can do, not just for Britain, but for the world. The Jenner Institute and the Vaccine Group pulling ahead on finding a vaccine uh, for COVID-19. The Epidemic Research Group finding a treatment to make COVID-19 less lethal with their research on dexamethasone. Or in the social sciences here at the Blavatnik School, the Oxford Government Response Tracker, tracking 163 governments' responses to the virus using 100 or so of Oxford University's alumni across the world working in different languages and bringing the data together that's helping our own cabinet office as well as other governments, researchers and economists really track the, the virus and how effective government responses to it are. Oxford University, for some 900 years, has been building and discovering ideas and knowledge, not just for Britain, but for the world. And that's part of why the world comes here to help us as students, as faculty, as researchers, and as officials who come and study with us at the Blavatnik School. It's a two-way learning process and it's one that fits the school's mission, which is to improve government through teaching, through research, and through engagement across the world, and to help governments learn from one another. We've been incredibly lucky as a school to have at least three former cabinet secretaries help us. Sitting here in front of me in the Blavatnik School is Lord Butler of Brockwell, Robin Butler was the seventh cabinet secretary that Britain had from 1988 to 1998. And as master of University College here in Oxford, he was extraordinarily generous in advice and in helping get the school underway and subsequently in tutoring Hong Kong civil servants coming to the school to study in the ways of Britain's constitution and politics. Gus O'Donnell, who I think is joining us online. Lord O'Donnell, the Cabinet Secretary from 2005 to 2011, who I remember speaking here in the school at the launch of the Government Civil Service Effectiveness Index and using the acronym ELBOW, E-L-B-O-W, to describe the positive effects an index can have on civil servants. He can explain those. I remember B stood for bragging rights a motivator he explained in government. And the 11th cabinet secretary, Lord Hayward, the very much missed late Jeremy Hayward, whose frank, clear, purposeful address here at the school was just an inspiration to public service for students, for researchers, and for faculty alike. And we're very proud to have a partnership with the Hayward Foundation that Suzanne Hayward has so brilliantly put together and the Hayward Fellowship, which brings a very senior civil servant to the school each year to, to forge innovative projects to take forward Jeremy Hayward's own mission to improve and to improve the innovation capabilities of Britain's civil service. Today we have Sir Mark Sedwill, the 12th British Cabinet Secretary, who has been Cabinet Secretary since 2018, having risen up through the ranks. Now, 
people note that he's only the second ever cabinet secretary who didn't serve time in treasury. But they should also note that he had an MPhil in economics from Oxford University, so an economically literate man who made his way through the foreign office, served as a UN weapons inspector in Cyprus, in Pakistan, Egypt, Iraq, served as international director of the UK border agency, and then as ambassador to Afghanistan, as NATO's high representative in Afghanistan, and mixing these international duties with his duties in London, heading different parts of the civil service. So Mark has, as the other civil servants I've mentioned today, served all of us by serving at the senior ranks of Britain's civil service. And it's an honor to have you here to address us today, Sir Mark. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, Nairi, thank you very much. And um, thank you, everyone, for joining us. People often ask whether I've kept a diary and whether I plan to write my memoirs. Well, to the approval, I hope, of Lord Butler and to the relief of whoever takes over from me, let me assure you that I haven't and I won't. Uh, although it is sometimes quite fun to come up with fantasy titles for it. I quite liked Big Ego's Thin Skins, given the amount of time one spends on personnel issues, but I decided to gift that to one of the chief whips. In the end, I settled on the years of living dangerously, and perhaps I'll use that as the theme for speeches and lectures as I head into my anecdotage over the next few years. But that isn't the purpose of today. I want to thank Nairi Woods and the Blavatnik School, not only for hosting me and you for this event, but more important for the outstanding partnership we've formed over the past few years, symbolised, as she just said, most poignantly in the establishment here of the Hayward Fellowship through the Hayward Foundation in memory of my late predecessor, Jeremy Hayward, Lord Hayward of Whitehall, which will provide opportunities for young civil servants from all backgrounds, Jeremy was very committed to diversity and inclusion, to be mentored by serving permanent secretaries to explore the key public policy issues of the day. Perhaps my remarks today might provide some material. This is my last significant lecture as Cabinet Secretary, National Security Advisor, and Head of the UK's Civil Service. And so in indicating what I see as the path ahead for the public service to address the challenges and opportunities of this extraordinary period in our national story, I thought I'd begin by reflecting briefly, you'll be relieved to hear, on my own journey to this point and how the formative experiences of serving my country in some of the most exotic and challenging parts of the world, as well as some of the most challenging jobs at home, shape my personal philosophy of governance and thus the lessons I draw for the future. 31 years ago this month, apprehensively, I entered a somewhat shabby office building about a mile from Whitehall and began my career in the diplomatic service. Margaret Thatcher was still prime minister. Robin Butler was the new cabinet secretary. The Berlin Wall was still standing. The primary terrorist threat was the IRA. People chain smoked in dingy offices. There were few computers and no mobile phones. And I remember being reprimanded for not wearing a jacket for a meeting with someone I'd now regard as a mid-ranking official, probably dressed in a T-shirt on Zoom. Incidentally, a top columnist complained recently that I wasn't wearing a jacket in a cabinet meeting, so not everything has changed in the past three decades. In my first job, I find myself on duty the weekend Saddam Hussein's Iraq invaded Kuwait. With the Cold War over, instability in the Middle East came back into focus, and so I was sent to learn Arabic, and then was then posted to Egypt, Syria, Jordan, and Iraq, the last as a UN weapons inspector, my first experience of operating in an international organization. After a posting in Cyprus, which is the closest I came to Western Europe, and where I met my wife windsurfing, my career shifted to South Asia with postings in Pakistan, and Afghanistan as ambassador and then the NATO representative. Probably the defining moment of my career as I led the Allied civilian effort during the Obama surge alongside Generals McChrystal and Petraeus, two of the outstanding leaders from whom I learned so much, and working for a great boss, Anders Fogh Rasmussen, the NATO Secretary General. After that came over four years at the Home Office and the last three plus as National Security Advisor and then Cabinet Secretary. There's an old joke about used cars. It isn't the years, it's the mileage. Well, my predecessors might have spent longer at the wheel 
I feel I've put quite a lot of miles on the clock. I've had a gun in my face from Saddam Hussein's bodyguards, a bomb under my seat at a polo match in the foothills of the Himalayas. I've been hosted by a man plotting to have me assassinated. I've been shot at, mortared, and even had someone come after me with a suicide vest. So when people ask me how I handle the political sniping, which is a regrettable feature of modern governance, I simply remind myself that it really isn't as bad as the real thing. I hope my successes escape both. All that aside, while serving in this job, the pace has kept up. We've seen the, the first chemical weapons attack in Western Europe in a century, the worst global pandemic in a century, and the era-defining issue of Brexit. Add in two general elections, a change of prime minister during a minority government, the tragic death of my predecessor, the biggest parliamentary defeats in history, scandals, leaks, resignations, plus a couple of constitutional crises. To go to uh, Lord Butler's favourite sport, it has been quite an innings, if more a one-day thrash against pace bowling on a rough wicket than an elegant test match special. While the first Cabinet Secretary was the National Security Advisor of his day, the next ten, as Nairi mentioned, spent their careers in domestic and economic policy, although several, like me, the 12th, were also tested in the furnace of running the Home Office. As the Prime Minister observed in our exchange of letters, my job has been primarily to help steer governments through crises. That's also really been the story of my whole career, and so the lessons I draw are from that set of experiences. I hope some of it is useful to my successors and, perhaps, to students of governance. Well, of course, I've learnt loads of lessons, mostly about myself and mostly from my mistakes. But since this is a lecture and not public therapy, I will leave those aside and confine myself to the three big lessons I draw for government. For the UK, for the past several centuries, among the most globalised economies and open societies in the world, there are three. First, the global is national and even local, and therefore in our own national interest, we must be involved in shaping the global agenda. Second, since we cannot do so alone, that, re that requires catalytic interventions alongside allies and partners and within this country, which are most effective if we bring together all our national capabilities in a common endeavour, fusion. Third, that requires first-rate professional and political system leadership and a first-rate modern public service system to be led. Let me touch on each of these in turn. I could spend days giving examples just from issues on which I've worked in my own career of how global events shape our domestic agenda. The fall of the Berlin Wall, the dot-com bubble, 9-11, the financial crisis, the Arab Spring, and of course COVID-19 are global events with profound national consequences and in many cases equally, equally profound consequences for communities and citizens. And all occur against the global megatrends. Aging societies and falling birth rates, globalisation, the fourth industrial revolution, which will have bigger economic and social consequences than any since the first, the rise of China and the Thucydidean rivalry with the United States, and biggest of all, climate change and how we respond. As Lenin observed, everything is connected to everything else. Climate change, for example, is not just an environmental question, but one which will have profound economic and social effects over the course of the next century. Just imagine the pressures which will arise in and from Africa as the Sahara spreads south and the world's only youthful population heads north. Think of the impact of rising sea levels on Bangladesh or the Commonwealth's small island states. COVID is a global public health crisis which has led to an unprecedented global economic shock, affecting the poorest and most vulnerable in our own society's worst and with geopolitical consequences inevitable but yet to be determined. And for the UK, as for other countries, our economy, society and politics will be dominated probably for the next decade by our response, recovery and renewal. Build Back Better is a national and global programme. For over a decade, the UK has taken an expansive view of national security. Successive governments have concluded that it should encompass not just keeping our citizens safe and our country secure, but also our economic prosperity and global influence. Climate change and the COVID crisis remind us that environmental security, societal resilience, health, well-being and inclusion, and even national identity and integrity are part of the same equation. Whatever lessons we learn at home about our national response to COVID, we know that the global system did not respond well to either the public health or economic shocks. 
It was at best fragmented and often contested. Second, given how exposed the UK is to global trends and how much of our future prosperity relies on grasping the economic opportunities of the global era, how do we shape, shape the global agenda? Throughout my career, the UK has been one of the few countries with a genuine global foreign policy. Most countries don't. They're preoccupied with their own issues, uh, their own national issues, and with their immediate neighbourhoods. For master, much of the past decade, however, the UK has found ourselves among their number. Having long taken for granted our national identity and global position, the 2014 and 2016 referendums heralded, heralded a period when our focus turned inward. And the first question visiting ministers would ask would not be what we thought about the global issue of the day, but how we were doing ourselves. The Prime Minister and Chancellor have set out recently how at home they want the past decade of retrenchment to become the next decade of recovery and renewal. In parallel abroad, the past decade of introspection should become the next decade of involvement and initiative. We have leadership opportunities. Notably next year when we host COP26, the major climate change summit, and take on the G7 presidency. As you might know, as part of my next phase portfolio, I'll be chairing a G7 panel on global economic resilience to address some of the market failures and distortions which the financial crisis and COVID economic crisis have highlighted. But there is much more to the UK's leadership role than the, dip than the diplomatic convening opportunities which arise from time to time. This brings me to the topic which has been the theme of my leadership in every leadership job I've done, epitomised in the national security community's fusion doctrine. I've given separate lectures on that, so I won't dwell upon it today, but simply highlight the key elements. First, collaborative strategic planning and implementation. Second, the deployment of all national capabilities, defence, diplomacy, development, economic and security, public, private and third sectors, citizens and communities in a common national endeavour. Third, the key role of government is to identify the catalytic interventions with which to lead those complex systems. I will return to the first two points in a moment, but I want to dwell briefly upon the third. When dealing with an international question, the UK is never the only and rarely the most important actor. And, whisper it quietly, the same is mostly true of government when dealing with a domestic policy question. Although the, uh, the view often in Whitehall and Westminster that government should be both omniscient and omnipotent and held accountable accordingly runs deep. As Keith Joseph joked, the first words every child learns in the English language are, quotes, what is the government going to do about it? Those of us who've been involved in building or rebuilding governance from scratch in countries like Afghanistan or Iraq, or indeed in supporting governments in other fragile or failed states, perhaps have a, a clearer perspective on the limitations of central government than we usually permit ourselves when examining our own. I've often seen myself as an outsider uh, with an insider's knowledge. In The Seven Pillars of Wisdom, T. E. Lawrence put it best. Do not try to do too much with your own hands. Better they do it tolerably than you do it perfectly. You are to help them, not do it for them. Actually, also, under their conditions, your practical work would not be as good as perhaps you think it is. Or in the famous development aphorism, better teach two fish than provide a fish. In a complex society and economy, and in an even more complex world, the role of government is to convene, orchestrate, and ensure that policy interventions catalyze the right response from citizens, communities, businesses, uh, and internationally from other countries. And they should be designed, or rather co-designed, with that purpose in mind, rather than reaching automatically for the traditional levers of legislation, regulation, or direction, which often provokes frustration in Whitehall that local and devolved government, business and charities, citizens and communities really aren't getting with the program. With all the data available to us in the modern era, the man or woman in, woman in Whitehall really should know best. But knowledge isn't impact, and so insight from big data should inform our leadership of the wider system, and that leadership must be persuasive and convening to be truly effective. And of course, nowadays, based on uh, data and behavioural science in understanding the impact of our actions. One of the proudest achievements of my time as Cabinet Secretary has been the establishment of the National Leadership Centre and of the Public Service Leadership Group, a top 300 to replace Whitehall's old top 200, bringing together great leaders from across the entire public service, military, police, fire, health, education, local devolved and national government, civil servants and other public servants, 
to build the networks to deliver for government and citizens and to learn from one another's leadership experiences. Or to put it simply, and perhaps for those of us who've been somewhat slow learners on this, Sunningdale on steroids. That also means systematic reform. I've never really thought of myself as the head of the civil service, but more as operating from the heart of the public service. My fondest memories of this job will be the time I've spent with our brilliant public servants from all disciplines on the front line. And one of the best leadership techniques I've developed is to bring that frontline perspective back to the policy center. While restructuring programs can be disruptive and controversial in the short term, properly designed and implemented, there is the opportunity to make governance one of the UK's competitive advantages over the next decade. We have a strong platform. We've seen the excellence of British public service over the past couple of years in the preparations for Brexit and in the response to the COVID crisis. We should apply that methodology, collaboration, innovation and impatience to normal business. As the Prime Minister indicated last week, whenever the COVID inquiry is, is held, it should of course ask whether the government took the right decisions at the right time. Let's reflect and learn. What I do know is that the response of the whole public service was extraordinary. In this country, unlike some others in, in uh, Western democracies, everyone who needed a ventilator, everyone who needed any kind of treatment for COVID had the treatment they needed. And I was at a company this morning that was involved in that endeavor. Teamwork between military, health professionals and civil servants delivered the Nightingale hospitals faster than China delivered theirs. With grassroots groups and the charitable sector, we designed and delivered programs to shield one and a half, of, uh, one and a half million of the medically vulnerable and other programs to support many more of the socially vulnerable who struggled with the lockdown. We designed and delivered the furlough program and the support to businesses and did so in record time. We registered millions for benefits and support to find new work. We repatriated over a million British citizens who risked being stranded overseas. And as the lockdown was being imposed, we planned for its release. The COVID secure economy, smart local lockdowns, school reopening, and as, as I've seen here in Oxford today, the search for effective treatments and vaccines, where the UK's world-class life sciences base and public-private partnerships puts us in a strong position to serve the needs not just of our own people, but of the global population. And we did all that while switching in the space of a few days from having 95% of our staff working in the office to 95% of them working at home, a process we are now thankfully reversing. But don't take my word for it or just focus on COVID. As we heard from Nairi earlier, the independent in-size assessment of public service capabilities launched here at the Blavatnik puts the UK in first place overall internationally, whilst also indicating where we can improve by learning from others. We should acknowledge that the best internationally are ahead on digital services and on diversity, despite huge improvements over the past few years. But we should celebrate that we are particularly strong in policy making, regulation where we're top, fiscal and financial management, procurement and openness. Public trust in civil servants and their own engagement scores are at record levels and are catching up with the uh, very high scores for medical and emergency services. An independent leadership assessment puts our top public servants on a par with the best of the private sector, although naturally more focused than their counterparts on collaboration and the citizen and less on the bottom line. However, Whitehall structures would be familiar to Gladstone. The West Lothian question is unresolved. Governance is highly centralised but federated at that centre. The British cabinet is twice the size of President Trump's and four times the size of President Xi Jinping's. Three quarters of the most, civil servants, most senior civil servants are based in London. Too few are from ethnic minorities. Whitehall is around a tenth of the civil service, which in turn is around a tenth of the wider public service. The boundaries within Whitehall are largely happenstance but skew ministerial and official behaviour. The upshot is that central government is too metropolitan, too short term, too siloed, too rivalrous, and too focused on the preoccupations of Westminster and Whitehall rather than the issues on the front line which matter to our citizens. All of that comes together in Whitehall, the fraction of the public service in the nucleus of the system. Our core job is, as I've said, system leadership, 
not policy formulation so much, not even policy advice, but policy delivery, i.e. the interventions required to catalyse the entire system to implement the programme of the government of the day, public, private and third sectors, communities and citizens. Reform of the civil service is rightly back on the agenda. A few months ago, Policy Exchange produced a thoughtful paper, Whitehall Reimagined, setting out a range of proposals for reform. It acknowledges significant improvements to the professionalism of many of our specialist functions, commercial, digital, financial, and HR. And whatever new ideas we adopt, that effort should continue. But much of the public debate about civil service reform confuses Whitehall with the wider civil service and falls into the trap of arguing that success is guaranteed by the injection of different kinds of clever people. More on that in a moment, because we need more than that too. We need the horizontal structures of government to be as strong as the vertical. The weft holds the warp together. This has been tried many times before. For example, Tony Blair's joined up government and Gordon Brown's cross-cutting public service agreements. For the past year, through the Strategic Framework Programme, we've sought to draw upon international best practice. New Zealand, for example, has developed a national performance framework which applies independent assessment to a range of indicators other than economic growth. In the UK, as I mentioned, this approach is most advanced in national security with the development of the fusion doctrine in the 2017 capability review. It applies our security defence, influence, communications, diplomatic and economic development capabilities to our security influence and economic goals and plans horizontally and collectively while delivering vertically and through the departments. It brings system leadership to implementation, i.e. getting ministers and officials to convene the sectors for which they're responsible, not just deploy the capabilities which they control. The strategic framework we've developed in the past couple of years extends this approach from security, prosperity and influence overseas to environment and sustainability, health, well-being, and inclusion, and to the integrity of the union. These half dozen pillars could form the basis of a UK national performance framework like New Zealand's, assessed independently against, against international criteria and comparators, such as the Sustainable Development Goals, IFI Indices of Competitiveness, the Wellbeing Index, NATO Criteria of Capability and Readiness, and so on. However, were we to apply, try to apply this fusion model, choose your own term if you prefer, to everything, we would overcomplicate issues which naturally sit with individual departments and have sometimes done so in the past. For example, as long as their programmes are designed to meet the wider government's agenda to raise skills and thus productivity, DfE should really just be left to get on with reforms to further education. But they will need other departments and their sectoral partners to help crack some of the most challenging issues with vulnerable children for which they are also responsible. This is invariably the case with prevention or early intervention on the knottiest social policy issues. My friend Louise Casey's outstanding work over many years on homelessness, troubled families and others for whom the system doesn't work uh, is a key example. How to approach each issue depends on its political priority for the government of the day and delivery complexity. The answer is not to create another central unit for every cross-cutting issue or every priority. The national security experience suggests that the best bet is to identify a few key government priorities which require the involvement of several departments and their sectors, apply the full fat collaborative model to those, allocate resources to those priorities first during spending reviews, and use a national performance framework to monitor department's progress against the rest. Different governments will, of course, have different priorities, and the job of the civil service is to deliver those, although many command wide political consensus. Climate action, strengthening the union, the productivity gap, and serious crime would probably all make the cut for most governments. Each should have a combined budget, be led by task forces led by ministers with officials, external experts and practitioners, and be overseen by the relevant cabinet committees. But what DNA do we need in the Whitehall nucleus? Well, there's long been an argument about generalists versus specialists and the effect of the churn of our brightest and best through different jobs on the development of genuine expertise. I agree with that critique. It is important, however, to understand um, some of the impetus. Over the past decade, part of that, part of the reason for rising churn among our best officials has been a decade of pay restraint. Some of our most talented have gone, leaving the remainder in a seller's market, able to move jobs, secure promotion, negotiate higher salaries in departments under uh, the uh, spotlight. 
So part of the reform agenda, to slow down churn, to keep people in areas where they can develop a genuine expertise, should be a fundamental review of pay, of progression, of pensions, and of the ACOBA rules, which impede interchange with the private sector for people rising through the system, uh, incentivize um, uh, uh, the solid but unspectacular to time serve, and propel churn among the most talented. It does need to be a comprehensive look. Whitehall needs all the talent we can get, so we must continue the effort to stimulate interest from people who wouldn't normally think of the civil service or even the public service. One of the big issues is to attract and promote people from every community in this country, especially from black and ethnic minorities who remain underrepresented in positions of authority and whose perspective is underrepresented uh, under in the policy debate. We have a proud record, but still much to address to meet our aspirations. We tend to refer to diversity and inclusion. In my view, the real answer is inclusion and diversity, i.e. an inclusive culture is the bedrock of a truly diverse institution. The Black Lives Matter movement reminded us that irrespective of the numbers of staff in the civil service at whatever level, the experiences of ethnic minorities of government and of public service, whether as officials within it or citizens depending on it, remain highly differentiated. The 2020s must be the decade in which this thing this becomes a thing of the, past, of the past. Moreover, new talent should complement, not juxtapose, and be embedded across the system. We should also embed red teaming and the champion challenger model in policy design, as we've done with the post-Chilcot Anaconda framework in national security. This requires ministers self-confident enough to welcome challenge to their schemes, as well as to the civil service, uh, business as usual, uh, rather than regarding that as mulishness or central uh, coerciveness from number 10 in the Treasury. Some of the injection of external talent should also come from exchanges with other countries' public services. We should exploit the in-size index to import best practice from elsewhere and challenge ourselves to be in the top ranks across the board, not just uh, overall. This should be part of a continuous and competitive improvement programme to maintain our position of the, at the top of the International Public Service League table and make it central to this country's international competitive advantage. The really big change for the civil service beyond Whitehall and for the wider public service in the 2020s will be the dual channel shift into digital services for the vast majority of our citizens, plus bespoke services for the vulnerable, disaffected, and those with complex needs. Amazon plus the Troubled Families Programme, if you like. Over the next few years, data-enabled digital tech should replace the work of thousands of civil servants in bulk processing units, dealing with tax and benefits and registrations and immigration and so on. But alongside that, we must recruit, retain, or retrain those with high EQ as well as high IQ to work at the sharp end with local government and the private and third sectors to wrap coherently the full range of public services around our most challenged or challenging citizens. Although this won't necessarily grab the headlines, this, this dual channel shift will be transformational and we need world-class leadership, digital and technical skills to deliver it just as they do in every other sector. Even with the current departmental structures, I mentioned the size of our cabinet earlier, we could deliver much of the improvement to coherence and impact by strengthening the horizontals and modernising the public service along the lines I've set out. And in view of the inevitable cost and political friction of any significant machinery of government change, most governments have mostly focused elsewhere. There is now uh, an opportunity, however, to shape government for the post-Brexit and post-COVID decade, to move more people out of Whitehall, and to embed active unionism and social inclusiveness firmly in government culture. Dominic Raab's 2013 paper, White Weight Watchers for Whitehall, set out a compelling argument for reducing the number of main Whitehall departments to around a dozen. Now, we all have our own favourites. Um, I have long argued uh, for an integrated Department of Global Affairs, a prospect which I hope the new FCDO, Foreign Commonwealth and Development Office, will realise. The key point, however, is not what my version is or anyone else's. It's that, our, like our main competitors, our machinery of government should be streamlined, stabilised and not subject to the vicissitudes of uh, frequent uh, reshuffles. As Michael Gove, the Chancellor of the Duchy of Lancaster, set out in his recent Ditchley speech, we must also energise governance beyond Whitehall. 
with a new compact with the devolved administrations as powers are repatriated from Brussels, and perhaps with territorial offices within England to advance the devolution and local growth agenda, lead reform of fragmented local structures, convene departments, metro mayors, etc., to identify and inject regional and devolved priorities into national policies, and to oversee and align their implementation uh, with local circumstances. Regional groups of MPs could enhance parliamentary engagement and scrutiny of such a mechanism. We've begun a programme within the civil service to appoint senior officials to the regions, much along the FCO's head of mission model, to improve the integration of civil service effort and engagement on the ground beyond Whitehall, and to provide focal points for moving more of Whitehall out to hubs and campuses elsewhere. As with any reform, the key is to do it properly. In this case, that means moving core, including ministerial functions, to the new hubs, not just the back office and operational activities. A package along these lines would amount to the most ambitious peacetime reforms to Whitehall and the wider, wider governance system since Attlee. We'd have to implement it while driving through the government's manifesto commitments, the post-Brexit reorientation of the economy, the COVID recovery, addressing climate change and the technological revolution, leading the G7 and COP26, all while, res all while wrestling with the challenges to the integrity of the UK. Bandwidth would be an issue, but in my view, trying to transform the economy and society through an untransformed untra government system is unlikely to prosper. And so I hope that uh, Michael Gove and my successor and Alex Chisholm will have the remit to press uh, ahead and parliamentary support accordingly. So there it is, 30 years of thinking about public service distilled into about 30 minutes of public reflections. While there's much talk about civil service reform, officials tend to talk about wider public service and governance reform, and I hope this valedictory lecture indicates why that more ambitious approach is the right one. President Franklin Roosevelt once remarked that there is no higher calling than public service. He meant political just as much as professional public service, and he was right. While politicians and officials have different pressures and different impetuses, and there are sometimes frictions between the two professions, government at all levels is most effective when we work as a team under clear political leadership in an atmosphere of mutual respect and support. And mostly, over my experience over the last 30 years, we've done just that. I've had a spectacular run over the past three decades and look forward to new opportunities in the next. I've served in some of the most challenging and rewarding jobs in national and international public service and alongside some of the most remarkable and dedicated people. It has been a privilege. Thank you. Well, thank you hugely, Mark, and lots of virtual applause as well, um, I'm sure. We're going to move now. We've got a moment for some questions. Those of you who are, have joined us um, online, please do send your questions in. They're being fed to me on this um, uh, tablet, I hope. Um, but I know that Lord Butler, who's sitting here in the school, has a first question. So would you like to ask your question? And for those of you who don't hear it, I will repeat it. Mark, first I congratulate you all and thank you for that very stimulating and exciting lecture. Um, things have got, uh, you, you talked about system leadership and about teamwork, and I agree with everything you said. Uh, at the political level, the cabinet is the system we have for coordinating government. And successive governments in recent years have been criticized for lack of coordination. And it's said that cabinet responsibility and collective government have been in decline. What advice would you give to your successor to try to reverse that and achieve an improvement in it? So the, the question for those that were unable to hear it is whether what, what Sir Mark would do to reverse the decline in cabinet responsibility and collective responsibility. Cabinet government. Ca sorry, cabinet government and collective responsibility. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you, Robin. Thanks, Lord Butler. Um, I remember attending a uh, seminar at All Souls given by one Sir Robin Butler about 
35 years ago. And you were um, talking about the ebb and flow of power and um, uh, how prime ministers at different stages of their premiership would be winning or losing the argument and how um, their power accordingly uh, ebbed and flows. And so uh, that was right at the end uh, of the era of a, a phenomenally powerful prime minister of whom people often said she had disabled cabinet government and the old spitting image joke uh, about um, ordering from the menu when uh, the waiter says, uh, and what about the vegetables? And she says, yes, they'll have the same. So um, without wanting to be flippant about the question, I genuinely think this has ebbed and flowed over the years. And you can make arguments about different prime ministers and, and different periods in their premiership and the degree to which they are dependent on the cabinet or the degree to which they move into a more sort of presidential style. And it was said of her, um, it was said of uh, Tony Blair, um, it's, it was said even at times of Theresa May, and, and of course it's been said um, of the current prime minister. It's often the case, of course, that, it, that these, th this, this position is, is um, perceived when a prime minister has, uh, has just won a big election and has got a lot of personal authority um, as, a, uh, as a result. I think the key um, is in ensuring that the mechanisms of cabinet government are there. I personally think, as I've said, cabinet is too large, and therefore the cabinet itself is quite a, 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 a cumbersome forum for genuine debate of the issues. If you have 25 or 30 people around the table, at best, only a few of them can have a significant intervention. But if you look at the subcommittees of cabinet, and I guess this would have been the same in your time, there is genuine um, political debate in those um, and genuine collective governance. So in the, um, uh, for example, the X, uh, XS committee, as it's now known, uh, which is the, essentially the Brexit Strategy Committee, chaired by the Prime Minister with half a dozen of his most senior ministers, looking at our negotiations with the EU, but also our trade negotiations with the US and others. There is really um, feisty political debate in that uh, forum, and the Prime Minister then um, uh, pulls together a conclusion, just as the textbooks would suggest. So I think we shouldn't assume that because the Cabinet itself may be quite large, it's quite a formal occasion, that there isn't genuine political debate and genuine uh, uh, dialogue uh, that then is followed through into, uh, into the cabinet. And of course, as we saw with the last prime minister, there were times when she simply couldn't um, secure the support of her cabinet for certain um, courses of action she wanted to follow in the Brexit negotiations after the 2017 election. Uh, and so you know, during that period, um, her management of the cabinet was a central preoccupation of her Premiership. So I think you were right when I attended that seminar all those years ago. The, the nature of cabinet government depends on the issues and also on the ebb and flow of prime ministerial authority, often on the issues of the day. So your answer would be smaller, a smaller cabinet and use subcommittees more. Is that right? I think, the, I think the cabinet should be smaller. And actually, if the cabinet were smaller, you might be able to use the committees of the cabinet rather less. But if the cabinet is going to remain two dozen, and sometimes we've had nearly three dozen people around that table, then cabinet committees are the place where the big uh, issues, not, uh, not necessarily the decisions are taken, but, but where the, the big issues are really thrashed out. The National Security Council is another example, founded by David Cameron. Um, it had, a, you know, it had its, its, its membership has ebbed and flowed a bit, but it, it has about half a dozen, maybe eight ministers on it. And there's a real discussion of a couple of agenda items um, and then a policy formulated as, as a result. And there's just something about the nature of meetings. You can run an efficient meeting, everyone can chip in more than once, have a real dialogue if it's a meeting of six or eight people. Really hard to do if it's a meeting of 26 or 28. So I have here a number of questions coming from the online audience. One uh, from journalist Rajiv Sayal at The Guardian. You and three senior permanent secretaries have left the government in recent months following anonymous briefings against each. How damaging to the civil service is the trend of anonymous briefings against officials, and what should government do to stop it? I think it's damaging to the process of governance, because um, if you want people to uh, take risks, be held accountable, then they have to know that they have um, uh, the support of uh, their leadership. And so any kind of anonymous briefing and sniping is demoralising for people, and that's true, by the way, in any in any profession or any uh, or uh, any uh, any organisation, it's 
it's not completely unique, but it has definitely uh, you know, risen in, 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 the last, uh, in the last few years, I think. And you know, there, are, there are different theories as to, as to why. To be fair to ministers, to be fair to this prime minister and his predecessor, and to, um, as essentially the lead minister on the civil service, Michael Gove and others, whenever they're given the chance to say something on the record, they are four square in their support for the civil service and the wider public service, their admiration for what we've done. Um, and so you know, having that political leadership um, offsetting some of the sniping that goes on, um, I think is, is really important. And of course, civil servants are not the only victims of the sniping. I pointed this out before. You know, there's an awful lot against ministers. There's an awful lot um, against, uh, against other figures. And it's just demoralizing for, uh, for everyone. It's, you know, there's, there's nothing more destabilizing for a, a senior cabinet minister to read a whole load of stuff in one of the newspapers about um, whether or not the skids are under them because of something that's, something that's happened. So it's a, it, it is regrettable. Um, uh, it is damaging to the whole process of confidence in governance. I don't think you should read into the fact that several of us are leaving you know, within the first year of a new parliament. I don't think you should read too much of a connection between the two. Is that a tone from the top issue? No, I think it's no. The tone from the top is positive. I mean, if you ask the Prime Minister was sitting here, he would say, in his own words, much the same as I have. He, de he deplores it. He, he's, you know, every time he's given the chance to say something you know, to the public, he's supportive of the civil service and the public service. Um, but uh, you know, it, it, there's an awful lot of gossip around and quite a lot of it spills out. It's just, it's just not good for anyone. Um, another question from um, uh, here is from Mark Fox, who asks... You've focused much praise on the public sector for delivering services and projects, for example, the Nightingale Hospitals. But the public sector is dependent on the private sector to deliver many vital services and projects. Would you reflect on the relationship between the private and public sectors? I know it's close to your heart. It is. Well, of course, Mark, thank you for the question. Um, I hope you did pick up the references to partnership between the public, private, and indeed the third sector to co-design um, and to operating in a common national, uh, national endeavour. And, and I was trying to make that point there, that actually government, you know, in, in complex societies, let alone a complex world, um, government can't achieve anything really significant entirely on our own. There are certain things we can do. We can legislate, we can regulate, we can communicate, we can lead. But in the end, all depends on the behaviour of citizens, communities, the private sector, um, the third sector, and indeed... Uh, the five million people in the in the public sector as well that take quite a lot of leadership too so i think um uh, uh for the U for the uk particularly as we move into this new era post brexit post covid the idea of a common national endeavor to really try and ensure this country is um competitive that we have the kind of society that um that we that we want to build in the 20 in the 2020s that we address these uh, these issues of inclusion across our society and particularly in in public services. That has to be a common endeavour. And one of the things I've, I've really been active in, in since I've been doing this job, and I think those who, on the line who, who um, uh, have experienced this would, would, would agree, is in, is in intense engagement with business, but also with public servants on the front line who are dealing with citizens and communities uh, at the sharp end. And I've always tried to bring that real world perspective back into the, uh, the, the debate at the centre of government. Mm. And Probably related to that issue, Chaz Buntra, um, Pro Vice Chancellor here at Oxford, has a question. So what can we, as public servants working in this university, do to help the civil service or the government? So the question there is, what can universities and academics do to help the civil service and government? Uh, uh, thank you. Um, uh, a great question. And can I, let, me, let me just, just comment on your, the first point about um, does the public really appreciate the, the 
great achievements of the wider public service, not only through COVID, but more generally. Actually, I think if you look at the confidence levels, they're really high. And you look at the clap for carers phenomenon for weeks after weeks after week, um, and the support people um, uh, have given the public and the, and the civil service within the public service, I think it's been extraordinary. So I think citizens understand that and understand actually just what an amazing job uh, that, that the whole public service has done in responding to this crisis. Of course, the question is, can we bring all of those qualities together, as I said, um, collaboration, innovation, and impatience, because impatience is an important edge here to, uh, to, to, to normal business and thus retain and build even more confidence among our citizens. On your point about universities, um, this is one of the great competitive advantages of the UK. I mean, Oxford is the top research university uh, in the world, or at least that's what Oxford says. I don't know whether everyone, uh, everyone else uh, would agree, but it is certainly among the top un research universities in the world. It's an, it's an extraordinary national asset, as are other, uh, others of our key leading uh, academic institutions. And those are assets not only in um, teaching and coaching and, and, and extending the mind and breadth of, and perspective of the rising generation, and of course many international students as well, and giving them exposure to each other, but the extraordinary research base, and then some of the work you and I were talking about, Charles, earlier on today, about turning some of that world-beating research into world-beating opportunities to grow our economy in a very competitive world when this country's economy is going to depend, be dependent upon innovation and tech um, in the broadest sense, whether that's synthetic biology, life sciences, quantum computing, um, AI, or, uh, or whatever. And in the end, our competitive advantage will arise because the big ideas are emerging from places like Oxford. And so how do we turn those things into um, opportunities for growth? We've often been... Uh, described as being brilliant at R&D in this country, but not so brilliant at the marketing and, um, uh, and development of the businesses. Actually, if you look even within R&D, we're brilliant at the R, we're probably pretty good, but not quite so good at the D, and we're definitely not as good as, as we should be at turning those into market opportunities. And in taking businesses that arise from places like this um, and turning them not into £10 million businesses that get sold out, but the next Bill Gates, the next Steve Jobs, the next Apple, the next Microsoft, the next Amazon. And that has to be the mission. And I think institutions like Oxford are right at the heart of it. Thank you. And then a question um, that speaks to another part of your comments tonight, which is how you see Britain's relationship with China and Russia developing in the next few years. Where will the United Kingdom be on the global stage, asks one of our audience. Um, they're really different. So I think it's, it's important not to bracket China and Russia uh, uh, together, although tactically sometimes they work together. Um, I mean, Russia we have, you know, we have really significant problems with. We, we want to have a good relationship. It's a major country in our hemisphere. But as we've seen, in, notably from the attack in Salisbury, they simply will not behave by the standards and according to the, the rules that the rest of the world operates by, and until they do, then it's going to be difficult for us, or indeed for any other Western democracy, to have a really normal relationship uh, with them. And there are areas where we have to uh, deter and defend ourselves against not only traditional military threats, but the constant threat of cyber warfare, of dirty money in politics, of, um, uh, of the use of militias and so on in including in parts, of, in parts of Europe, as we've seen in Ukraine and so on elsewhere. So, so there's a lawlessness about Russia, which is a real problem for the modern world. And uh, while uh, we would prefer, you know, I, you know diplomacy is not about talking to your friends. We'd prefer to find a way of having a dialogue um, with them that would bring them into compliance with international norms. In the end, until they're in compliance with international norms, we can't have a normal relationship. China, of course, is the big... Uh, is, you know, the rise of China is really the big geopolitical question for the world, and in particular, the relationship between the China and the United States. And I referred to the Thucydides trap, um, uh, which, uh, which of course is the, is the theme of much geopolitical analysis, including, I suspect, in this university um, at the moment. Um, we've never seen a country with a the political system that China has, essentially an authoritarian political system, um, uh, have such a significant. Uh, economic impact on, on uh, the world. You know, we've never had an economy that size with that system. And so we are going to have to adapt the global system to deal uh, with that. 
there are questions about the degree to which China is willing to um, uh, uh, accept and, and uh, com comply with all of the rules of the global economic and, and uh, political, uh, political system. Uh, there are market distortions that arise simply as a result of China's scale and the nature of a, an economy of that structure that is different to the economies of the Western um, uh, of the Western world. And so one of the themes of the G7 panel that I'm going to be chairing next year is learning from COVID, learning from the financial crisis of 2008. How do we address the market distortions that in, the global, in the global market that have, that have arisen, not just because of China, just because of the pace of change in globalization, where countries with different economic structures are trying to operate together? During the Cold War, and really for, the most, for most of modern history, um, essentially, the biggest economic powers have been Western democracies, and therefore, you know, open market economies and so on of you know, different um, uh, of different degrees at different times have essentially been competing within a system um, that um, that was that that um, uh, was essentially created after after World War Two. This is this is different, and we have to address the we have to uh, um, uh, uh, look at the the rules of the system in order to be able to accommodate China. In some areas, we'll cooperate with them climate change being an obvious example. In other areas, economically, we would expect to compete with them, but with the rules of the game clear and consistent for everyone. And there'll be some areas which we will have to contest, uh, their track record in Hong Kong, their track record with the Uyghurs and so on, uh, 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 for example. It will be a complex relationship, but it's crit critically important that we and other Western democracies get it right. Which part of that is going to be the hardest for Britain? Um, I mean, which part, you, you've said, that we need to adapt the global system to deal with China. And you've, you've said by cooperating, competing, and, and contesting. But which, what do you think Britain is going to find the hardest to do to accommodate this new model? Um, I don't think it's for us alone. I mean, the key here is that there is a consensus. This is why the G7 matters among um, uh, like-minded countries, the leading Western democracies, European countries, Australia, Japan, etc. Others too about what the global rules should be in the 21st century, and the degree to which we're going to ensure that those global rules apply to everyone, and therefore competition is fair competition, free trade is fair trade, etc. And that's a you know, that's a big issue that's that's in is um, highly political in many countries. It's not as as um, our government has made clear in our country's interest to see a lurch towards protectionism internationally. We would suffer from that. We have an open economy. Uh, highly globalised. So we want to be a champion for free trade globally. It's in our national interest that that is the case. Using the G7 and other fora like that, I think we can play a leadership role in doing so. The, key, the, the hardest part will be if we can't, um, for us and for, indeed for other countries, if we can't uh, move together uh, and if we can't find a consensus among ourselves on what the rules of that game should be. Now I see we have just one minute left and I think I have to give it to a combination of Oliver Wright from The Times and another uh, questioner who are basically asking, what's the biggest challenge your successor is going to have? <laughs> um, I, think, uh, the, I, mean, I, think, I think by far the biggest challenge is that incredibly ambitious agenda that the government has set and that circumstances dictate and ensuring that the civil service machine is able to provide the support to ministers and the government that they will need as they navigate the country through those things. And as I've said, I hope, um, able to lead the reform of the civil and public service at the same time. That's a, you know, it, is, it, is a, it is an intense period. My success is going to be operating in uh, 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 as intense a period as I was, hopefully uh, intense because it's predictable um, rather than uh, uh, with some of the crises that, that we faced in my time, but it is going to be an intense period, a, a very ambitious agenda, um, fast-changing uh, circumstances and uh, reform of the system needed in order to ensure this country is in the right shape to deal with it in support of uh, uh, this, this Prime Minister and this government. Terrific. Um, Sir Mark said, well, thank you so much. Um, we've covered a lot of ground and we're looking... Uh, forward to a vision you've given us of, a, of a, a Britain with a more diverse and responsive civil service, with a smaller cabinet that works more cohesively together, with effective partnerships between government, business, local government, civil society. 
that competes and cooperates and is prepared to contest with China, but change the global system with allies, and that confronts Brexit, COVID, and a changing world order in a very positive spirit. Huge amounts of wisdom tonight. Thank you so much Thank from you. all of us, and we wish you all the best in your next endeavors, which we know will involve public service. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you.